we get started. Um, we are lucky today to have uh, John Gabrielli um, uh, speaking to us from MIT. Uh, John is uh, uh, director of the Marquinhos Imaging Lab um, at MIT, among other uh, positions. John has done uh, has done a lot of work on the the neural bases of uh, learning and learning difficulties. Uh, he's done, among other things, he's done groundbreaking work on the, um, the neural bases for reading issues like uh, dyslexia. Now, the, the thing I love most about uh, John's work is that he's not been content to sit in his imaging lab at MIT and um, collect academic accolades, although he's done plenty of that. He's been doing more trying to connect um, what we're learning in uh, imaging studies with what's happening in classrooms and in schools. Something that, uh, that building those bridges between um, laboratory and, and the classroom is, is difficult because it's not really been done effectively before. But absolutely essential that the goal is, is eventually that it improve, take what he's been learning to improve uh, student outcomes. So, uh, John is going to be speaking today about uh, some work uh, locally on, um, on the relationship between mindfulness measures and academic achievement. But my guess is he may also uh, touch on. Um, other topics as well. So, in any case, thanks, John, for, for joining us. So, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today. I, uh, I have an affiliation, an official affiliation with the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I have multiple collaborations. I see several of my collaborators here. And so uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to be, to be here and, and what for, for me is a sort of a sister institution uh, to, to MIT uh, personally. And, and Tom, I think the very first times I ever discussed doing uh, uh, research that might touch on issues of education w was with Tom, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, excellent uh, introduction to the field. Um, so yeah, so uh, M Marty's here, and uh, we've done work with Meredith Rowe and Ethan uh, Shearer's back there, who have been awesome collaborators. I'm also an element of a collaboration between uh, Graduate School of Education and MIT called Reach Every Reader, which is targeted at um, improving reading outcomes for young children. So I have many. I'm, I'm, I'm over here pretty often, right? uh, uh, which is a great. Um, and so, um, you know, there's this huge optimism uh, that uh, we might address issues of inform improving learning and education through multiple sources of convergent evidence, um, through uh, psychological understandings of how children learn, through um, uh, neuroscience, which is maybe the most uh, esoteric of those measures, uh, and through things like machine learning or artificial intelligence. So we might have all these new resources to better understand how a child learns and what policies and practices might improve educational outcomes for children. And at the same time, even for those of us who uh, have a background in neuroscience and who are interested in where neuroscience fits in understanding how a child learns and develops, um, we, we see a lot of books where we, we question the quite the application of, of, of brain stuff to uh, the classroom, right? So. Uh, so these are books, I, they may be pretty good books, I just took them off the web, but I can tell you this, as somebody who spent you know, his career working on uh, understanding the human brain, first in patients with brain injuries and then subsequently in brain imaging, it's really hard to say what lessons you can directly take from understanding the human brain or animal work behind the understanding of the human brain and a teacher in a classroom with a student or a parent at home with a child. So uh, I, I, sometimes I go to education conferences and there was an awesome motivational speaker and he was jumping on the table the teachers were clapping and everything. like oh, I never get that kind of response ever. <laughs> and he's like, like it's, we'll, we'll try to do that today <laughs> and he's like come on we'll clap you know because uh, we know about the amygdala I'll come back to the amygdala at the end of my talk and it's an important structure for emotion so if you teach and reach kids emotion you're turning on their amygdala and they'll remember stuff better and I thought, well, number one is nobody really knows how to tell a teacher or a parent you know, to get to the amygdala, right? It's, okay, that's, that's, that's not a, a prescription for a teacher or an advice you can give to a teacher. And, and number two, you, know, you wouldn't even know what an education would look like that gets to the amygdala, right? And three, if you're a teacher, you know that having a boring class that doesn't touch on emotions is not likely to be an effective 
teaching environment. Is that okay? You didn't need to know about that the amygdala exists to decide that emotionally touching students. And it's complicated. You may know the research that if there's too much emotion, children will remember and adults will remember the emotion and not the content, right? Uh, this is famous for ads, right? If an ad is really touching, and you go, I'll never forget the ad about the kid crying about her parent or something. And you go, yeah, what was it for? I don't remember. It was just so touching, right? So, <laughs> ads, yeah, 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 yeah. so we know that emotion is actually a little bit tricky how to use that effectively for engagement. So anyway, a lot of things about brains are, are, are claims that are very broad and not really have any uh, practical or, or, or scientific basis. Um, and so people have written essays to John Brewer years ago that education and the brain, you know, the brain are bridge too far. The idea that jumping from the brain to the classroom to the student is a bridge too far. Um, just a few years ago, uh, there was a paper in the Psychological Review that ended with this thing. Neuroscientists can, cannot help educators, but educators can help neuroscientists. <laughs> We're a pretty, a pretty aggressive paper, so I was invited to write a rebuttal to the paper. Uh, <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, three topics. One is uh, relations of education, brain, and socioeconomic status, the idea of opportunity uh, gaps and how to think about them. Um, a second part about early language reading in the brain and interventions, and the last part about mindfulness, stress, and brain. Um, so, uh, uh, I'm going to make this slightly provocative, and you can judge whether it's good or not. So it's not uncommon for people to, I think, compare the relationships of research-oriented efforts in uh, medicine and education. I mean, both involve people who you want to help. Right? One involves teachers, one in, and, and, and other people involved in school administration and organization. One involves physicians and hospitals, right? And in both cases, you would like the basic research to interact with the clinical care, let's say. And, and that's been made, although you can have many criticisms, I think, of uh, how academic medical research occurs. Uh, there's sort of a simple context for that. So I collaborate a lot with people at Mass General Hospital, and they teach medical students. They also see patients, and they do a lot of the research. It's sort of integrated, right? So I'm going to say the, the following thing. It's striking to me how in education these things are not so integrated, although I'm lucky to work with collaborators who are really open-minded and, and, and wonderful collaborators. Uh, and I think that's because of the historical thing that learning has somehow become the, the domain of psychology and neuroscience and education, schools of education, and yet learning is the essence of education, right? So how do those things get historically separated? So when I was a postdoctoral fellow at William James Hall, but that is a 10-minute walk from here at most, okay? When I was at Stanford in the psychology department, even closer to the Stanford uh, School of Education, the amount of interaction between those psychology departments where they were studying things like learning, uh, growth mindset, and Carol Dweck at Stanford, direct interactions with anybody in the School of Education was shockingly minimal. And I think that's true here. Is that even today? Is that uh, looking at? Uh, you know, so so you have, it's a historical remnant of just you know how fields have evolved that you know one set of uh, one department has a uh, scientist studying psychology and neuroscience and how that underlies learning and another department uh, or, or school you know studies how learning occurs in schools and the two logically seems like they should be integrated as much as possible with, with many levels of things not applying back and forth but some levels yes um, so education research often the way I think about it is uh, from the, as a non-expert is that uh, inputs are thought about, the curriculum, the teachers, the class size, technology, learning time on the one hand, and outcomes like test scores, educational attainment, completion of high school and college, and so on. And you know where uh, cognitive psychology and, and cognitive neuroscience can contribute is trying to understand something in between the input and the output, uh, the mental representations and processes that support that, both for cognition and for social emotional processes. So um, a lot of the things we do depend on uh, brain neuroimaging of children. Um, um, uh, and uh, uh, by now, it's very common. When we started, it wasn't so common. So this is a room we have at MIT where young children come in and get used to a pretend scanner, a mock scanner that makes noises and rumbles like the real one. So they're comfortable by the time they go into a big machine. And, I could t and people will say, well, how, much, how do kids like to be in a brain imaging scanner? Now, we don't go pull kids out of uh, playgrounds and yank them into a scanner, right? So we don't have a phone store imaging center. They've already agreed to do that, right? I can tell you very few kids come out. Uh, they're, they're pretty happy. They're told they can come out anytime they want. Um, and, and they actually fit better in the scanner than adults because <laughs> you've been in a scanner that's a little claustrophobic, you know, for some uh, bigger people or grown-ups at all. And for kids, it's much more spacious, right? Plus, kids don't realize the lesson yet that every technology that you think is safe now 
will turn out to be destroying your planet. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't learned that message yet, so they're kind of like, cool, spaceship. Uh, and we have a wonderful note, you know, this, we need a few of these uh, from a girl who wrote a woman to Stanford. Uh, she uh, draws a noisy scanner. She says, you have let me have more fun in three days than I could have in any other place. Just think of it, I'm playing a game when at the same time I'm a research guinea pig. A couple points off the spelling if you're a tough grader. <laughs> <laughs> I might help someone else my age if they have any brain problems while still earning money. And what do you think beats that nothing? It's kind of beautiful, right? It's kind of exactly all researchers. You know, nothing beats that. Uh, and yet we want our stipends and salaries. <laughs> so... Um, uh, uh, turning, you know, to, to a very serious topic is uh, uh, income inequality. And this is a map from some years ago. I should check if it's still right, but it's pretty close. So this is not of, of, of wealth, but of inequality across societies, right? And so they made the U.S. as ground zero. It was purple. Everything in blue are areas that have uh, less income inequality. Everything in red are more. And so most of the world uh, has uh, less income inequality than the United States. And this is just a, a factor of distribution of income. Um, uh, and we also know that income is intimately tied, uh, as is race in the United States, to academic outcomes. Uh, uh, but, but there's, uh, over time, and, and, and I've heard some updates from talking with Andrew uh, today about, is it still a kind of correct? Uh, where's, where's Marty? It's a tie. More on the tie. You know, the idea that uh, income gaps in terms of academic outcomes um, or opportunity outcomes are, are growing, if anything, and, and, uh, and, and high. And racial gaps still exist in terms of opportunity, but that's somewhat diminished over time. That, in a sense, the economic one is becoming a, a more potent uh, society wide. Uh, and uh, in terms of educational attainment, um, uh, the odds of completing a bachelor's uh, degree uh, from some years ago dramatically goes up depending on family income. Um, so we, we know that there's incredibly strong correlation between socioeconomic status and critical education outcomes on behalf of uh, children and young adults. Um, and one measure that we can have uh, of this are, are so-called high-stakes statewide standardized tests, or just statewide tests of math and reading as, a, as an outcome measure of, of certain aspects of education. Um, and so a, a thing we got to do uh, working with, with Marty and Ethan uh, is link brain structure and function to these measures of education outcome. And we know that tests measure some things, not everything, but they measure some things. Uh, and so one of the measures we have is, uh, looks at uh, the white matter of the brain. So you may remember the gray matter are the neurons that comprise uh, the gray matter of the brain. Um, I'm always struck with an MRI, top of the brain, bottom of the brain, uh, how much white matter we have in our brain. <laughs> All the myelinated axons that are the sort of super communication pathways across the brain uh, and the thin ribbon or cortex or bark of, of cerebral cortex six layers deep uh, in, the, in the human brain. So I'll talk about both gray matter and white matter, but I'm going to focus for a moment, actually on gray matter, I'm sorry. Um, and then we can, a person can go in a scanner, and you can uh, take a typical structural MRI from ear to ear. And then you can quantify the outcome of that and measure, you can measure a number of things, but here we measure the thickness of the cortex. So we just sort of basically uh, segmented the brain and said, how thick is the cortex? That simple measure of cortical thickness of the brain. And then we, what we found was this. If we took statewide test scores in eighth graders uh, and related them to the thickness of the brain, everything you see in color here in, in yellow and red are areas above our th statistical threshold of significance. The thicker those areas were, the more they correlated with performance on the statewide tests. So we have this direct correlation between brain anatomy and statewide test performance as an educational outcome. Um, uh, you would expect something like that, because the, the mind is what the brain does for neuroscientists. You know, we expect a relationship between those things. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's any behavior that doesn't have a brain correlate, we just didn't measure it correctly uh, uh, in some way. You know, there's issues of interpretation, but uh, the, the, everything that happens in the mind is supported by what happens in the brain. Um, but here's the uh, other contrast, uh, comparing uh, the difference between 
uh, individuals who have, came from families with lower income or higher income as divided by uh, paid lunch and free lunch. And I know this distinction has become less useful over time, but at the time we did the study, Marty, can I double check with you on this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is a, both a good thing and a bad thing to have your super expert co-authors who know more than you do sitting there in case they go like, oh, I, I sent you an email saying no. <laughs> 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 uh, um, anyway, so, uh, so, uh, so this shows the difference. Thicker cortex in area families who came from um, higher income than lower income. And if you just go back one slide, you can see there's a pretty strong overlap in those regions. Uh, not surprisingly given the statistical relationship between socioeconomic status and scores out in school. It is a bit of a mystery in the following way, and let me tell you about this. So you, you know this, but let me remind you that a striking thing is that in contrast to almost everything that gets bigger in humans from birth to young adulthood, uh, the thickness of the cerebral cortex in humans gets thinner, uh, and strikingly thinner from, a, uh, from a, about age five all the way to young adulthood, and then it stays steady until bad things happen in later years. Uh, and so this is uh, showing you the thinning of the cortex in typical development. Researchers at NIH did a striking time-lapse photography of real data just made it where they show you the uh, brain thinning of the brain for real subjects in longitudinal studies from age 4 to 21. So basically we're going from pre-K to the college uh, graduation. And here's the time-lapse uh, uh, depiction. So now you know, elementary school, high school, entry into college, college diploma, thin cortex and done with most of your education, right? So uh, this thinning is, is a universal characteristic of, of human brain uh, development. And so, so it's a little complicated I'm just, uh, because we, we said that higher SES is most often associated with thicker cortex. I showed you that. Um, and that almost everybody finds something like that. And it's a very common finding. Now, there's a lot of papers on this. In other studies that have looked at the relationship between the thickness of the cortex and performance on some kinds of tests, it was better to have thinner cortex. So we just said it was better to have thicker in terms of education outcomes. Here, it was better to have thinner. We suspect uh, that these reflect samples of children who are uh, primarily come from higher income families. Because unless you make a deliberate effort to recruit more representative samples, uh, I can tell you as a researcher that who shows up in your laboratory to do brain imaging experiments tends to be higher income individuals. Or, and that's even more so with children. Because when you send out to uh, listservs and things like that, the opportunity to participate in research at MIT or Stanford where we've done our work, who are the parents who see that and go, wow, this would be a perfect thing to do on a Saturday with my five-year-old. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going yeah. to be parents who go like, step one for admission to, you know, MIT and Stanford, or whatever they're at, or, you know, this is a great educational experience, so that getting that science down will get them ready, you know, for their uh, SATs, or whatever, right? It does intend to be, of course, on average, low-income families who have many challenges and burdens who spontaneously jump to participate in research in the university. So we suspect these older studies are, are you know, very focused on higher S uh, SES individuals. And then the other interesting question, which we don't know and don't have a good answer yet, is ex what you might think of as accelerated th thinning that's occurring in children and students coming from lower income families. Is that detrimental or adaptive or both? All right? Is it better, for example, to develop more quickly in more adverse environments and reach the final stage and not be vulnerable to plastic influences, right? Or is it detrimental in some ways or some complicated balance? So there's not it's not that a thicker cortex is a better one. We thin it regularly. Sometimes it's better to be thinner uh, in these studies. And so we don't really have a deep understanding yet of how to interpret this in terms of is it a problem, is it a strategy to get around a problem, uh, and, how, and what's the best thing about that. Um, another area that we're very interested in uh, is, 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 is our many who study uh, variation in academic outcomes or executive functions very broadly. They're, goal-directed uh, thinking capacities uh, paying, like, involved in things like cognitive control, regulation of cognitive and emotional processes. And they can be tested in a variety of ways which are somewhat different but you know, often highly correlated, working memory, reasoning, flexibility, problem solving. All these things are not content specific. They're not knowing math. They're not knowing reading. But they're uh, mental capacities you have to focus on a goal and use your resources to accomplish that goal. And so again, working with uh, 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 Marty West and Ethan and others, uh, we, we looked at the relationship, and part of the reason why it's interesting is here's a study from Martha Farah looking at uh, test scores on math 
and finding that the relationship between socioeconomic status that the, uh, that the child uh, has, the family, you know, sort of goes through executive function in terms of influencing math outcomes. So executive function seems to carry a lot of the psychological variation that goes with socioeconomic status in regards to math performance. Um, and brain imaging studies have uh, uniformly found, um, uh, this is a meta-analysis of almost 200 studies, that when people do cognitively demanding tasks in this abstract executive function sense, they tend to engage prefrontal cortex and parietal cortex bilaterally. And we did a paper some years ago showing that if you do fluid reasoning measures, you get that as well. So almost everybody gets the activation of this network of frontal areas and parietal areas when people do uh, high level things, so if they cross a broad range of, of, of abstract tasks. So in this set of 53 diverse uh, uh, eighth graders, um, we gave them this task where they had to do uh, a simple task, simply look, watch out for the W, or a slightly harder one where they had to push a button every time two uh, subsequent letters were the same. These letters are appearing one after the other fairly rapidly. Or, this is a hard one, push the button when the letter you see in front of you is the same as you saw two back. So think of, it sounds easy if I just say that, but think about this, a letter comes up, it disappears. You have to remember that one. Now this comes up, doesn't matter if it matches that, right? You have to keep both of those in mind because the next one that comes up could match this. But you have to remember that even if this one doesn't match, it could match the one that co are coming. Does that mind giving you an impression of that? And then breaking your hierarchy of three back, <laughs> where you're having all this stuff sitting in working memory. Actually, uh, the uh, uh, graduate students might like to put a good uh, way to ex even explain it to the participants that it was like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Match those two pieces of bread, but remember the peanut butter and the jelly in between. Okay, that was the best <laughs> way to <laughs> even communicate with the task. So, it, so the idea is that it's all the same task at one level, but we're making it harder and harder parametrically. Each step up makes it a more difficult, demanding measure of executive function or working memory. Uh, and as you'd expect, uh, here's per, you know performance goes down as the task gets harder. Um, and here's what we found. Uh, if we just looked at everybody's performance overall, in fact, as tasks got harder, they turned on these areas of frontal cortex and parietal cortex. So like, like the literature, the harder something gets, the more these areas are recruited. The better you do on the math portion of the, of the uh, statewide test in Massachusetts, the more these areas are recruited in the parietal cortex. Um, and if we compare children coming from higher or lower income families, uh, we see this greater activation for this working memory task in the children who come from the higher income families. So, uh, yeah. Just to clarify, I'm, I'm a little confused what you're showing. Is this, are these scans like fMRI, like while they're oh, doing I should, the test? I, 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 well, yeah, it's fMRI. I okay. shift, I shift, bad, bad teaching. <laughs> but, uh, I shifted from structural to functional. I should have underlined Okay. This. So the first step was structural, I'm sorry. And, and uh, these were, I shifted to functional okay. during the working memory task. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. That, Thanks. I glossed over there. Um, and to give you a sense of the pattern of the findings, uh, like area C, this parietal cortex, here's the two groups. You can see the two groups are kind of similar at zero or one back, but then they diverge at the more demanding levels. The, the, the activation really rises in the children from the higher income families, but it can't or doesn't rise as much uh, in the children from lower income families. So this is a functional imaging study that sort of aligns in some broad sense with the structural imaging study. Um, so, brain differences are associated with academic achievement um, and, and RCS, but we don't know at all to what extent they involve genetics, environments, or complex interactions between the two. We just do not know. Um, uh, an important thing is that brain differences don't indicate fixed biological or cognitive differences. Sometimes people have the intuition that if you see test performance on a test or a psychological measure, well, those are flexible depending on your teacher and the content and so on. Right? But brain things are like fixed. I mean, because you got one brain when you were born, and if you measure that, they're fixed. Some people have that intuition. And I just want to share with you that, of course, anything that's plastic in the human mind, anything that can grow, that can learn, there has to be this equal plasticity or flexibility of the brain structures that support it. So there's nothing more constraining about a brain difference than there is about a test score difference or an educational attainment difference that we observe. Is that okay? Yeah, because sometimes people have the intuition that biology is more fixed, that psychology of the brain is more fixed in the mind, and the opposite is true. They, one is the, you know, the flip side of the other. Um, 
and for the and the brain is plastic. I'll even show you some evidence in, a few, in, in just a few minutes about plasticity, uh, and that in one study that we did, it was even greater in children in lower-income families. So there's nothing to say about the possibilities for these children, but it just as a measurement at a particular time. Um, so people who study psycholinguistics and linguistics have to uh, explain how. Uh, children so brilliantly learn from their caretakers the native language in which they speak, right? It's kind of a puzzle. That's what they have to unsolve. Like, there's no instruction manual or course that parents get. They just brilliantly enhance uh, the language capacities of their child interactively. Um, you may know that one of the more famous studies is from Hart and Risley about variance in language experience in relation to family income or socioeconomic status. So they recorded it each month for two and a half years, every word spoken at home between parents and child uh, for a one full hour. And they divided them into three categories. And their main finding, which I'll tell you here that's the most famous, is that if they extrapolated the language experience of these young children at home over the years, uh, uh, so they measured some hours, but they extrapolated that out over their years, that they estimated that children coming from the highest income families heard 30 million more words spoken to them than children from the, the lowest income families uh, before they ever got to school. So this has been a, a, a strikingly concerning study in the sense of thinking about school readiness and that even before a child you know, has his or her first day in school, and we kind of know this anyway, but here's a strikingly empirical piece of this, uh, this huge difference in opportunity uh, that's been afforded to some children compared to others. And this is before the kindergarten or first grade teacher gives their first lesson, right? This huge di disparity in, in opportunity of language experience. Um, a topic that we're super interested in and have received an incredibly little scientific interest is though that within higher or lower education families or income families, there's huge variance. So every dot here is a different family. And look at this, the variance is huge, okay? So people talk about the gap in language, in language experience in children from different families. But it's not all about income, okay? Uh, because, you know, this, this higher ed income person is speaking much less to his or her child than this person is from, is that okay? I think that's a hugely interesting topic, and we have almost no comments <coughs> on, on, on what drives that. Is that uh, I'm looking around just in case. Uh, so uh, uh, so I, I think that's an understudied topic, uh, treating everybody as if they were one entity. And so understanding that would be a huge step forward, and we're super excited. Where's this work of Meredith Rowe uh, that I'm going to talk about? Who's with? And, uh, and since the early studies, uh, researchers in the whole who have studied this think that even more important than the number of words that you hear are the quality of the linguistic experience that a child has at home. And so they focus on things like child-directed speech when an adult speaks in a way that seems to be engaging to the child, um, and conversational terms, what people call serve and volley, the back and forth conversation, which is a very powerful mixture of language and social interaction. Uh, and that that, although it always correlates with that, families that speak more, have more conversational turns, there's more words spoken, that the most important factor, if you had to pick one, might be the sheer number of intensive, interactive conversations, that, where the social and linguistic turns are serving back and forth between parent and child. Mm -hmm. So together with Rachel Romeo and uh, Meredith Rowe, uh, we took advantage of a technology. You know, when we look back at what Hart and Newsley did, they must have had an army of suffering undergraduate <laughs> graduate students counting up words from tape recorders. You know, I'm listening to something. Uh, uh, now there's an automated device uh, that does a pretty good job of estimating the number of spoken words that a child can wear uh, at home. And we send this home for a, a weekend uh, to record conversation and to estimate the ex language experience uh, from that weekend of, 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 ch of children uh, four to six. So we replicated a lot of things that are typically found. So adult words per hour, uh, uh, they, and the, you know, children who came from higher SES families had more, and it translates into uh, uh, or relates to, correlates with uh, big differences in vocabulary uh, because conversations are not the only source of vocabulary acquisition in children, but they're a major source. And so th these are, and in fact, if we take our lowest income and highest income uh, uh, quarters of our sample, we replicate the extrapolated 30 million word difference. So, uh, so th this is just showing you that this is our, our samples having that typical range of experience in linguistic uh, input at home. And now we added, because uh, this is what we do, we added a brain measure because we were interested in what is it in the brain that changes in relation to linguistic experience. Um, and so the child went into the scanner. It's really tough to get 
four-year-old children or five-year-old children to do complicated tasks. So we have to work a lot to figure out you know, what's a suitable task. So we just had them passively listen to stories. But what we varied was, so the hearing stories, auditory processing line, what we varied was uh, this. So this. Some stories were like this. Tim and his friend were playing hide and seek. Tim hid in the closet, but then he sneezed. His friend quickly found him. Tim asked if he could hide again, and his friend started counting. This time, it took a long time to find Tim. They're okay stories, they're not super kind. But this is the other dream we had. Night, 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 so uh, it's hard to know what the right comparison is, but sometimes people feel like we're capturing a lot of the same perceptual qualities because it's the same, stim same stimulus backwards, okay? So uh, 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 at, at least it, it's one thing you can be convinced of, there's no comprehension going on, okay? So there's auditory stimulation, but no comprehension. And uh, we were, the two classic language areas of the brain are in the left hemisphere, a Broca's area in the frontal cortex, and Wernicke's area uh, in, the, in the superior temporal gyral area in the parietal cortex. So those are the two areas that we wondered, especially if they would be influenced by um, language experience. And this is what we found. The more often that children had conversational talk or turns back and forth with their parents, parents, uh, the stronger was the response to these stories while they were hearing them in the scanner in Broca's area. So this is a brain mechanism uh, that's involved, we think, by correlation, that's involved in uh, taking the experience of more language back and forth, and then to somehow engage more powerfully in the perception of language uh, in the scanner. And we controlled for some things and saw, uh, uh, you know, so we, if we control for SES, we still got most of the effect. So this is really actually for us very motivating in terms of uh, thinking about interventions. Even when we take out socioeconomic status, most of the effect is there. Okay. Um, so what that, that goes with this idea that I showed you that there's huge variation in families. So what counts by far is the number in this sample is the number of conversational terms, not the educational and income background of the families. And what's hopeful about that is, you know, it's easier, I think, to potentially support that than it is to have massive social reforms and especially for parents who've already gone through their education. I mean, you could root for all of that. But that means that there's a lever or that you might be able to uh, support on behalf of parents of all income levels and educational background. Or cognitive abilities or verbal abilities or all three. I mean, the more we control things, we start to lose effect a little bit. But it's, it persists uh, even when we control for everything um, that we measured. Uh, and just to give you a simple one, this is fMRI. Here's two girls, uh, same age, uh, same socioeconomic status. This girl heard an estimated 1,200 conversational terms a day. This one half as much. I mean, you, you know, this is a bit of a correlation. It's just each one individually, but that gives you a sense of where the correlation comes from. Now, the other kind of uh, measure that we can do structurally is to look at white matter. So it's a structural measure coming up, white matter of the brain. Um, and it's based, so there's all this unbelievable amount of white matter we have connecting different parts of our brain, the myelinated axons. Um, so we use something called diffusion tensor imaging. It actually measures uh, movement of water at very tiny uh, distances. Um, and so if water is floating around in your cerebrospinal fluid, it, floats, uh, it can flow everywhere. If it's around a bundle of myelinated axons, a bunch of axons to a molecule of water that's a big physical barrier, they can't go through that set of axons any more than I can go through this table. And so they tend to flow parallel to that. So we use this parallel flow of water as an indicator in the brain of where the white matter tracts are. And it gives us a chance also to characterize how strong that flow is directionally. Is that okay? So it's an it's a indirect measure of white matter properties of the brain. Um, so here's an example of an individual person. What's coded in the brain for that white matter of that individual, it's red if the water seems to be flowing left to right connecting the two hemispheres, blue if it's up and down, cortical, subcortical, and green if it's a back and forth uh, in the cortex. And so here's what that looks like. And so we can quantify this. Um, 
And we get, again, in the same children, four to six-year-olds, the more conversational turns they have at home, the more powerful is the, uh, what we, looks like connectivity, the structural connectivity of the left arcuate fasciculus. And I'll come back to this, but the left arcuate fasciculus, as shown here in blue, is that arguably the most important white matter structure for human language. It connects the two major areas of language in the brain, Wernicke's area and Broca's area. So if there were, uh, we actually pre-registered this uh, as a hypothesis because uh, it, it made the most sense. Um, and these are the correlations. But again, the more often a child experiences back and forth conversation above and beyond SES, um, the more powerful is the connection between these two core language areas. And so I think it's just really cool. I mean, in a sense, it doesn't add anything to the behavioral data. Okay, it, it doesn't. If you knew the behavioral data and you knew the vocabulary outcomes and the education outcomes for these children have more language, you already know that, and that's the most important thing. And so we got a lot of attention on this. Uh, and so, uh, so here's, here's, a, here's a touchy issue, uh, which is, um, you know, when, when, when do brain images uh, ought to become or not, not become part of public dialogue about policy or practice? So we know that they're not. The, we know they're not the most important outcomes. They're not. It's the child's happiness, the child's welfare, their progress in school, their sense of their self, everything you would wish for a child, right? Um, uh, but uh, uh, but there is a certain segment of society. It's, not, it's a pretty big one that you go, oh, we did this, and then they go, blah blah blah. Oh, and here's the brain picture <laughs> of what would happen if families were supported to talk to their kid. Now I say this with a huge amount of worry because this, you know, this is. This is, you have to do this very responsibly to do this correctly. But if one of the things you happen to be interested in is not only figuring out uh, some things, but how you might hope to influence public policy, responsibly reported brain data is a pretty powerful communicator. And you could argue, psychologists hate this. Okay? They go like, we don't have to measure all this brain stuff. It gets too much attention and too much money, you know, and it doesn't, it solves some things, but it doesn't really tell you about the mind. You study the mind to study the mind, not the brain to study the mind. But if you want to somehow get people to pay attention to things and devote resources to things and change policies or practices, uh, you, you, have a lot, you need a lot of different ways to catch their attention if you want to change things. And so I think responsibly reported brain data ought to be an element of that discussion. Um, but, but you could worry about its abuse pretty easily. Um, um, and here's just a, instead of a, a group average, here's again the two girls who are matched for experience and this difference between uh, conversations, 210 conversations or 95 uh, per, estimated per hour. So let me turn back. Although spoken language for most children is a quite, yeah. So just wondering, if we're looking at the arctic and they and the connectivity there, is that related also to the depths of the, of, of the, of the, the um, cortical matter, matter. You pointed out in the beginning that we get thinning, right? And so, is that as you as you think at uh, as you age, is the stronger relationship like the supposed to useful? I mean, is that also thinning so that you have a relationship in terms of size? And yeah, it's a great question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So it's um. So as you go from five to twenty or thirty, you know, before decline starts to be. Um, uh, uh, the white matter expands greatly, even as the gray matter is, is receding. Okay, it's a really interesting trade-off, and in this is why actually imaging for you know for quite young children is really easy because their brains are almost the size of adults, and they're almost the size because the gray matter will thin and the white matter will expand. So they, it goes in opposite ways. Is that okay? In, in terms of sheer volume, but the, the white matter gets bigger all the way into your t early 20s, and the gray matter gets thinner all the way into your 20s. And so, head size, brain size remains almost only grows in a small amount because of this trade-off between the two. So, as much as you could talk about the natural development of spoken and, and heard language in most situations, um, you know, reading is exactly the opposite, right? Reading is boot camp uh, for children. Reading is the first educational experiences in which they have to learn something that's really, really hard and completely unnatural uh, in human development, which is how to uh, you know, understand how spoken language is made visible by print. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, every time any, any school district or school makes progress in reading, you know, they want congratulations for that and all that stuff. And in fact, teachers have to work hard, parents have to work hard, kids have to work hard to learn to read. 
Um, and about 10% of children, uh, sometimes maybe 15, depending on, there's no uh, clear cut line, um, really struggle with learning how to read and are diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, and uh, for many years, uh, so I need to just remind you of something for a moment that many of you know, but you know, children might learn the names of objects to simplify child development in 30 seconds. Um, and they just know there's the word book or the word scarf or something like that. Uh, when they go to school to learn to read, they have to be told a secret. And to me, actually, uh, I think we underemphasize the way in which they have to work against their initial representations of, of spoken words. Um, so I'm looking around here, and I can, I, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that if I mention no Santa Claus will come down your chimney this Christmas. <laughs> You're okay with that, right? Easter Bunny. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, 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 like, how old do you have to be uh, for the teacher to tell you, you know, you thought the word was book, kind of a single sound. But now that you're getting ready to read, we have to reveal old <coughs> enough to hear that it's actually made up of three distinct sounds, the, the, the three phonemes. And we have to tell you that because that's what you need to know to learn how to read. You have to know how uh, units of print correspond to spoken language because you start with spoken language. So I think part of the reason why it's learning to read is hard and very hard for some children is they have to unlearn an initial template of a word pretty broadly and all of a sudden you, you reveal to them shockingly that there's this hidden sound units within the word. Um, and they need to know that so they can match up these sound units to the units of print and about 45 uh, phonemes in English. And this awareness, this conscious awareness that between sound and print, uh, you know, people will talk about a phrase something like phonological awareness. You have to be aware uh, of the l l relationship between sound and print to learn to read. Um, and there's other issues as well that people talk about in reading difficulties, and I won't go into that. But from uh, up until the 1980s, people had assumed that dyslexia was primarily a visual problem. The intuition was um, uh, that uh, kids, are, most kids, they're fine at home, they're speaking, they're hearing, everything's going well. They go to school, the print comes out, and they're struggling. And they go, well, of course, it's a visual thing, right? And it wasn't until the 1980s uh, that people discovered that the source of most forms of reading difficulty are actually specifically this related to this process of consciously and explicitly understanding of the relationship between spoken sound units and printed material. Um, and so one of the uh, things uh, that we were interested in is how early can we identify uh, children who are on the path to reading difficulty? Um, and this is interesting in terms of um, uh, policy because uh, uh, this is actually uh, some of the work I'm about to show you. We testified from the Massachusetts legislature and from the Rhode Island legislature because parents who have children with uh, reading difficulties with dyslexia feel that schools don't respond to that very well. Now, all parents worry about their kids. Uh, you could view it in different ways how to think about that. But uh, what the two things they asked of the state legislature was to um, have an early screening test to identify children who are at high risk of reading difficulties. And then, and I, you know, I'll be political on this for a moment, I'll say, that seems like a good thing. Uh, 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 but although I'll tell you the two tricks on that is, one of them is every measure we have now over identifies the number of children who appear to be at risk by a one to one ratio of the best measures. So for every child we correctly identify before they begin to read, that they will struggle to read. There's another child that we, I also identify as being at risk who will read satisfactorily. All right, so that's, that's, so I think one of the burdens that schools had was, um, well then are we going to have to be obliged to provide extra services to all these children when half of them don't need it? And in an era of res limited resources, I do appreciate that that's a challenge uh, for, for schools. Um, anyway, so one of the questions we said is, can we identify dyslexia before reading failure uh, by brain measures? And so in a study with uh, Nadine Gab at Children's Hospital, um, we screened about 1,500 kindergartners over three years at 19 diverse schools, sent reports to parents and teachers, brought in about 180 for uh, more careful behavioral testing, and then followed those children for a couple of years. Um, and you might ask, if you're testing a child before he or she uh, begins kindergarten or the very first days. Now, some parents have their kids reading a lot. Since there's individual variation, but most have not. Um, but you can test these language capacities that we know are related to reading difficulties. So to give you a feeling of that, you might, ask to, you might say to the child, say bold. And now say bold without saying buh. And you're 
fingers are crossed a child will say old. All right. Um, or blending words. What do these sounds make? T, toy. And you hope they can put them together for toy. Does that make sense? Okay. Or non word repetition. I can do mad, but I can't even do the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, these, these, are slang, these are all tests of spoken language, but they involve skills that correlate highly with reading success in later years. Um, and so we ask, if we look in the brain at this point, before any education has occurred, uh, a formal education has occurred, and we use this diffusion tensor image measure of white matter, look at the arcuate fasciculus, what we found was this, the better the children did on these kinds of tests, you know, the stronger child by child was this connectivity in the arcuate fasciculus connecting the language areas. That is, uh, to summarize it simply, um, uh, a child who has a better or worse score on these a test of spoken linguistic abilities that are important for learning to read, uh, you can see big differences in them on average uh, uh, before they get instruction. So instruction, quality of instruction matters. Of course it matters. But these are children whose brains are different and for whom reading will be difficult uh, and extra support will be needed for them to do well. Um, and uh, and so we saw this child who uh, scored poorly on phonological awareness and was a poor reader at first, was a poor reader at first grade, and we know at second grade as well, this child was a good reader. It's not one-to-one. -one. We don't do better. I wish we did better. I'll show you one example where we sometimes do better. It's not doing better than the behavioral tests. You know, this is our original scientific goal, that we would beat the behavioral test with the brain measures and predicting which child's at true risk. And at the moment, we, we don't beat that. Um, so, okay, now, now, now comes the part where I get a little controversial with you or not, so you'll see. You'll see. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things, uh, and Tom and I discussed this a bit earlier today in various contexts, um, if we said that uh, in medicine, so I'm used to working in, in mental health difficulties where let's say if you try either a behavioral therapy or, or, or medicine, you do a randomized controlled trial. And let's pretend some people get medication and some people get placebo, and you see after the trial is over, how, how their anxiety decrease or their, their depression increase or something like that. Right? And we know that these kinds of trials have all kinds of interesting limitations. A big one you might have seen is, uh, uh, you could summarize it this way, there's trials to tell you when to get on a medicine but not when to get off a medicine. Have you heard that? <laughs> yeah. Because people are on these medicines far more and need to be in many cases, as far as one can tell, for eight weeks. So the clinical trials go, I'm sorry, we're done with that trial because we can't just keep following people indefinitely. Is that, is that okay? So there's li huge limitations on these things really in terms of practical life. But, but still there's a method for that. You, you, you want random assignment, you want a control group. And um, uh, uh, to go to a school, I think, and say, ooh, we have something really cool about social emotional, about reading, about math, and we're convinced you know, based on our thinking at MIT or, or Harvard or something, that you should use this curriculum, you know? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's a really hard thing to sell to schools. Is this, is this fair? Because they think they're doing a good job now. I mean, as best they can under the circumstances they have. I mean, I, I, you know, teachers are not going like, yeah, I knew it was a crummy curriculum, but, you know, they made me do it. You know? So they believe in their curriculum, as all of us believe in kind of what we do. So, you know, so what would be the evidence you would need to even tell communicate with a teacher or a school that it's something worth trying as opposed to just by some theory you have, it might work, right? So wh what we lack, I think, is kind of, um, um, uh, uh, we lack, I think, like a launching pad for these kinds of things. And that, that eight week, 12 week kind of way that drug treatments and behavioral treatments are, and device treatments are evaluated in biomedical research. I feel like it's not easy to find a comparable thing in education research because teachers are super busy. You know, why would they substitute something that you think is a good idea versus something they have, have experiences being good at? Is that, is, that, is that a fair experience? Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 they probably get all kinds of brochures all the time from companies going like, you know, definitely buy our curriculum stuff with 10 times as good, right? So, uh, uh, you know, so I, I feel like a good spot for my experience uh, are to try something to say there's a pretty good chance it might work in broader, deeper application of school year or summer programs. Because that can be like a medical clinical trial. You have a limited amount of time and you see whether there's a signal of things on the right path. It's not as rich as a whole year of curriculum, but you don't have to go to schools to experimentally try curricula. 
uh, without any evidence that it might work. This is, you know, this is, it could be different perspectives. And all. So here's what I like about summer programs. Uh, we, could do, we could do careful characterization of participants. I'm going to talk about this in a moment, but I'm a huge fan of what a lot of people believe in, which is that uh, ch what ch children are different from one another in deep ways. And so the more we understand about child by child something, the more we can understand for whom what works, instead of just thinking one program works for everybody. Then you can have an intent, a targeted, intensive, personalized uh, intervention in some way with a control group, and then you can, you can evaluate its outcome. Because you're organizing the program, you can do everything you can for professional development and fidelity of, of delivery. Uh, because you're, you can't perfect those things, but you can do everything you can to make the teachers supported uh, and, and aligned as much as possible so that you're not having a failure of finding because a, a teacher was not supported with the right materials or, or, or curriculum. So I like that as a place, you know, um, where you have enough science, you can control the uh, beginning and end, and you have enough uh, 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 interaction with teachers and educators to, to, to make sure that you deliver the program well. And so, um, and again, the reason to think about this individual characterization is, you know, we often report program average results, but we know if each dot is a child who got better or worse with the program, that individual children vary considerably how they respond to any educational intervention, almost any one. So we ran a summer study a couple years ago uh, at MIT with 65 first and second graders uh, with reading disability. Um, uh, uh, for six weeks, they had 100 hours of reading instruction in small groups. 25 uh, children were on a waiting list control group. We were able to rec recruit a fairly diverse set of families. And we did uh, structural brain imaging before and after. So um, here's what we found. Here's the waiting control group. Zero is where they started. These are children who are already identified and we further characterize as having a reading impairment. Right? So the waiting control group, and, and we didn't, by the way, we didn't forbid parents from doing anything they wanted with their kid. We just said, you know, we'll see you in the fall. Um, uh, you know, their scores go way down in the summer. And the last thing you would want for a child who's already behind on reading a year or two is to even fall further behind across the summer. Yeah. I'm sorry, why is it called the waiting control? Oh, sorry. Um, that means we don't act, didn't give them the active comparison. So uh, the best thing you could do is to have an active control group, like maybe you get reading instruction and maybe you get video game instruction, something like this. So they're both doing something, they're both active, they both feel special, okay? That's the preferred uh, uh, wait list means you're not doing anything in the summer. You see how they did, and then they get, some, they get the intervention after that. But the, the science part is over by then. Is that okay? So it's a, it's a weakened version in the sense of a, 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 a control group, but it's a, it's a randomized select number of children who fall into that. It's business as usual. Yes. yes, but in the summer, of course, yeah, it's, I would call it business as usual, and parents can do whatever they want. Yeah, business as usual, yes. Awesome. Yeah. Just what's the scale? Is that, are those standard deviations? Yes, a standard scores. Like six points, eight points. I mean, but those are those are those are z-scored by the, essentially by the standardized tests. So we take the standardization of the test, which is you know, uh, 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 and we use those standardized age, age adjusted standards. Eight standard. points, which is fairly big for this kind of thing. I understand it wouldn't have to be. Um, okay. Standardized scores would. So standardized is the standard deviation is one? No, standardized, standardized scores, I'm sorry, and I, I don't know how to convert the eight in my head of standing up here. You get a raw score, and then the test booklet has, yeah, has, says, distributes out the test scores. Uh, so eight points is, I can tell you, it's a fairly sizable one. You could think of it as eight points on an IQ test, eight points to go down but eight it's, points. it's a scaled score. It's a scaled score, yes, I'm sorry. These aren't these uh, normal curve equivalents, are they? No, it's a straight scale score by age. Uh, so eight points is meaning, meaningful. It's not giant, but it's meaningful for a child who's already multiple points behind. But okay, let me let me go up for a sec. So the group that got the intervention on average stays where they were, not what we wanted. We didn't want a summer intervention to leave a child where they were, although it's still better than get, becoming worse than you were. Yes. But within this, um, there's children who decline as much, who got the intervention, who declined as much as the children who didn't get anything. And there's another group who improved. So this goes back to this idea that we're very interested in what, what, what you know, the, the fit between an educational approach and an individual child. Um, and then you could wonder, uh, what is it about a child that lets some children benefit from this program here compared to here, 
and other children not benefit at all. Is, you know, their test scores are as, as if they never had to program, and they got had, had, had 100 hours of small group instruction. Yeah. Uh, I'm really interested. So I have a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. So first, you had 25 kids, and you documented statistically significant Declines. decline over the summer yeah. on on a reading test. Correct. But that's difficult. That, that's that's very difficult. For, for a sample size of 25, I mean, I'm used to you need hundreds of kids to notice anything. No, this, but it's big enough. Yeah, I, I, I could tell you. They all went down practically. OK, and then how did you separate your two subgroups of non how did ah, you decide that, non Yes. So that's, that's, that's a post hoc. <laughs> that's like, we go, ooh. See, the, these children are better off than these. This would be the comparison control, but they're not improving to where they started. Then we go, oh, let's divide them into two. And that's what we get. So that's based on their performance. Afterwards. But how do you divide them into two without just mechanically ending up? I mean, just do the measurement error and stuff, you're going to end up seeing. It could be that. So you don't know that those groups are actually improving and not improving? Well, the reason, let me, yeah. So let me tell you two reasons why we think they might really be. Uh, except for one measure, which is extremely different. They're improving on one, two, three, four independent measures, the same children. So, you know, yeah, that feels like above chance. If it were one measure, I'd feel more that way. But I'm going to show you something else that makes me think about that, um, where, where brain evidence is helpful. Uh, uh, but I agree with you. At any time we divide up people after, you know, we know their outcomes, there's always a question of or, or risk of misinterpreting that. Because you're dividing them based on their outcomes? Right? Actually, yes. Okay. Um, so first I'll tell you, the best predictor we had, and we wanted to have much better predictors than this, by far, was the socioeconomic status of the family. Children who came from lower income families had, had, had the bulk of the improvement uh, uh, that we measured. So that, was a, so that uh, uh, speaks to that, yeah. Um, to, just to go back to how you were sure. dividing those groups up, is it that everyone, like exactly half of kids had a positive it, response, it turns exactly out half it, had a negative response? Yes, I know this. I know it's almost uh, worrisomely perfectly symmetric, but yes, it was almost perfectly that way. Okay, so so neither of those, like the positive response isn't an average of negative and positive. It's like only positive, only positive, only negative. Yeah, and yeah but when you average the two, we go to zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it just happened to play. It doesn't have to be that way. It could have been 30%. It just, uh, yeah, so all this, you know, to begs for kind of extension replication, right, for, for the reasons b both these questions are. Okay, so, um, um, and now this is one place where brain evidence chips in a little bit to, you know, maybe make you slightly more optimistic that we got a real difference. Uh, so here's the absence of a difference over those eight weeks or so uh, uh, in brain structure or anatomy in the children who got uh, no intervention, the so-called waiting list group or the, you know, the ones who got nothing. Uh, business as usual. This is the brain uh, uh, differences, uh, non-significant, non in the children whose scores did not go up, the ineffective one. And here's the thickening of the cortex in the children whose scores went up. So, you know, it feels like uh, 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 that makes you feel a bit better uh, that, you know, that it wasn't like you're saying some measurement error that we just, you know, uh, because of the post-hoc division. But it could have been uh, other things they were doing that summer yeah. could have given the thickening, which could have led. Yes, to we can't we can't rule that out. Um, okay. So, um, you know, just as I think for two minutes and then. So one of the things we want to do is sometimes is see whether brain data ever beats behavioral data because all of the best it corroborates it. And, and, and usually just describes it or gives you a correlation. Um, and, we, and we know that uh, co correlations tend to be overly optimistic, that you tend to get a strong or a correlation in one study, then you do the next study and it tends to go down. Um, and so we're interested in, in, in seeing uh, whether we can uh, get rigorous prediction out of this. So, um, so uh, we did a study with Miko Heft where we, had, uh, we looked at children who were somewhat older. We didn't control anything in here really. Um, and we know that some children get better at reading who are poor readers who have dyslexia, and some don't. We were just thinking about what goes on in the brain for children who make substantial progress versus those who don't. Um, and so uh, we asked these children to be in the scanner together with typically reading children and perform a rhyme task, a little like light and bite, so we can move the soft drink functional MRI. So 
rhyme, which is a kind of thing where you're forcing people to think about sounds associated with words. It's a sort of forcing experiment. And to make their life miserable, we don't make them look the same, so you really have to know their rhyme. You really have to know the sound of that word in front of you to answer that correctly. 25 children with dyslexia, 20 typically reading children. We did functional MRI at the beginning, give 17 behavioral measures of language reading and IQ, and then we saw them two and a half years later. And the only thing we did two and a half years later was saw, measured how they had improved in reading or not. So the longitudinal study, the only measure two and a half years later is whether these children make, how much progress they made in their reading. So here's the performance. So let me start with this. This is single word accuracy, which was our sort of a priori measure. 100 is a population average in a standardized test. This is the testing from time one to time two of our control group. So they're above average. You could say, well, this is how bad is the school system that the children make no progress in reading in two and a half years? I could tell you that's because it's age standardized. It's age adjusted. So they were t good readers to start with, and they were good readers when they were done. The children who are poor readers, again, postdoc, uh, fell into two groups, a group who seemed to make progress for single word accuracy and a group that did not. Even more interestingly, that same group of children who made progress for single word reading made a lot of progress reading comprehension, that is reading a paragraph and understanding what the gist of the paragraph is. And that's the end point of reading, right? More than reading a single word accurately, you want a child to be able to read a paragraph and understand what the content of the paragraph. Um, and so uh, what we found, to our surprise, uh, was that the children who improved the most over the next two and a half years, when we saw them at baseline, were the children who activated the right frontal cortex which is the wrong place, okay? It's a left hemisphere that's a language hemisphere. It's a left hemisphere that's dominant for, for most aspects of reading uh, and skilled readers. And yet it was the response in the right hemisphere. The more they responded to these words in the rhyming task, the more progress the children made over two and a half years. Um, so one thing we know is uh, that as children first begin to read, they have pretty bilateral responses to letters. Because at first, the letters are like a, a, like a visual spatial puzzle for a child. Is it a B or a D? What is that? You know, they're solving a letter. So, right? And then with skilled reading, letters become automatic entries into words and their meanings. So uh, a bilateral early response to letters becomes left lateralized in more fluent older readers. And we also know that for very simple word tasks, the bulk of the evidence suggests that uh, activation moves posteriorly in developing typical readers. And the idea is that as you become an automated, fluent, good reader, the back of your brain solves all the simple reading stuff, and the front of your brain is you know, free to think about content and meaning and irony and inference. This is kind of the intuitive interpretation. And so having the front of the brain on the right activation on the wrong, incorrect hemisphere be the spot that most predicts reading outcomes for poor readers was kind of an unexpected outcome. But I think most of the literature has gone along with this kind of observation since then. And because if you're from MIT, you've got to talk about uh, support vector machines and machine learning. <laughs> we apply that to the SMRI data as well. Uh, and so here's the gist of the finding. None of the 17 behavioral measures predicted alone or in combination which child would get better or which would get, not get better in the next uh, two and a half years. None of them in any combination. Um, if we used our machine learning uh, uh, algorithm, we would be 92% uh, correct in identifying whether a child at baseline belonged to the one group or the other. So here's one example. We would have to replicate this uh, to where brain measures seem to better predict future outcomes for children over two and a half years than standard behavioral measures. But um, you know, we know fMRI is not going to become a part of our everyday uh, education evaluation. But, but it does do a couple things. One is it suggests that children who make the most progress in reading, who start with a read brain difference in reading difficulty, that they do so by a path that's different from typically developing children. When I first worked in this field, I was convinced that what you wanted to do was see the activation pattern in the brain of a poor reader become like a good reader. Does that make sense? You say, like, if we have effective intervention, if the teacher is working, you know, we want the brain of that poor reading child to look like a good reading child. But it turns out that the children who make the most progress do so in a completely different way. And so this idea of a really diverse way of responding to education uh, being actually advantageous in those children, we still worry about the children who don't have that alternate path uh, available to them. So the last thing I'm going to do, and I'll, this will be pretty fast. Um, you have until 5.30, so yeah. if you want to save time for a strict question and answer, that's fine, but don't get a rush. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't yeah. what you were talking about before. So what you were just saying is 
you want them to look like the good readers? Were you able to look at the control group of good readers and see if they had an activation in that sense? No. Yeah, sorry, I, did, I rushed back to the control group. Uh, has they, they turn it on somewhat, but it has nothing to do with their progress in reading. Even if you, did you try breaking up the group in half? Or yeah, no. Yeah, it, just, it just didn't have any relation at all. And we would expect that. Everything we understand from the literature is that most of the actions in the left hemisphere are typically developing readers for the 85% or so who don't struggle to read. Is that, is that okay? It, it could have been the way you're describing, but it didn't appear to be that way. All right, switching entirely to uh, this. So, um, a mindfulness. Um, pay attention in a particular way in the present moment, non judgmentally. Uh, many things count as mindfulness. Um, this is a graph of public interest in mindfulness. You, you may, it's all over the place, right? Okay. Right. Um, so, uh, w working with Marty and Ethan, we asked this following question uh, For all the enthusiasm on mindfulness, are mindful students better learners in school? You'd think. That would be established. And I just want to say to Marty, like a lot of people say, we don't need to know that. But we thought it might be useful to know, is a student who's more mindful a more effective learner in school? Uh, because if you're going to promote mindfulness, you might want to know whether it's something that's likely to help a student. Could, there could be other reasons besides academic effectiveness that you, you would want to promote mindfulness. But for school, it's especially interesting if, it, you know, if it's associated with uh, better academic outcomes. So we saw 2,000 urban students in grades uh, 5 to 8. Uh, this is the distribution of um, sex and uh, race and ethnicity. And they answered questions like this. It seems I'm running on automatic uh, without much awareness of what I'm doing. I do jobs or tasks automatically without being aware of what I'm doing. So we're not asking them to say, how mindful are you? Because that would be kind of a weird question to ask anybody. We're asking them these kinds of simple tasks. Um, I find myself doing things without paying attention. And they simply rate it. And I had a really nice meeting with, with the students in, this, in the peer program. And uh, one of the things we discussed a little bit was the uh, you know, scientific uncertainty of how you think about things like self-report measures, especially in kids. Um, anyway, um, so uh, what we found was this, basic. Uh, the higher the children reported themselves to be, the students reported themselves to be mindful, the better their grades, the better their test scores on statewide tests, the better their attendance, and the um, less frequent their suspension. All things you would wish for a student. Better grades, better test scores, fewer absences, fewer suspensions. Um, the effect size was a, about the same, was in the same uh, ballpark as uh, more well-known kinds of measures like growth mindset and grit. Um, so uh, stress, uh, this just came out this year. They went to 146 countries. And they found that on average, 35% of people said they feel super stressed. In the US, for whatever reason, it's 55%. It's kind of interesting. So this is polling data. Um, similar to Sri Lanka, Uganda, and Costa Rica, countries where there's many more reasons in terms of pure economics to feel more stress. Um, so it's really an interesting uh, disproportionate sense of self-reported stress in the U.S. compared to what you might think from a socioeconomic perspective. Here's three things that make you more likely to report stress, and I'll say a word about them. Um, if you're younger, if you're poor, and if you disapprove of our current president. This is um, so we know that chronic and severe stress is associated with, with a lot of uh, undesirable outcomes in terms of school performance, in terms of anxiety and depression. Very briefly, I want to mention this, uh, these amazingly uh, concerning uh, recent numbers on the rise of depression in teenagers and young adults, uh, dramatic, you know, substantially increasing over the last 10 years. Um, we, you know, some people worry whether that's oversensitivity in some sense or better reporting, more accurate reporting, it could be all those things. But uh, uh, on the other side of that, here's a paper that came out this year. They looked at emergency room visits for children who attempted to commit suicide or parents who brought them in thinking they're about to commit suicide. So we don't think this is a sensitivity issue. We think this is a crisis issue. Uh, that's a 100% increase in the last decade, children coming in uh, with parents saying they just attempted or about to, they feel they're about to attempt suicide. So there's this huge problem going on. Is it, you know, and in children and adolescents, you know, mindfulness training reduces self-reported stress. So that's a positive way. So we asked whether school-based mindfulness training can reduce stress in students, and is there brain plasticity that goes with that? And it turns out to be helpful to know that. Randomized control trial, 99 sixth graders in an urban school, 40 participated in the brain imaging. I'll tell you the brain imaging set. They, got a, they were randomly assigned to a mindfulness training program for computer coding. I remember sitting around with Marty and others 
discussing what the control condition would be. Because usually your control conditions are kind of blah, because it makes your study more likely to work. Uh, but these schools like, well, they don't want to waste their students' time. They're students they want the support, right? So everybody, yeah, I, my, the story I tell, Brian, and you can correct me, is about half the researchers around the table thought the, the best thing for their kid would be computer coding, and about half. Yeah, we all wanted to be in Scrum. <laughs> yeah, so, so they're both positive things, you know, for students' experience. Eight, day, eight weeks, uh, 45 minute class a day, four days a week. Um, okay, thank you. And, uh, uh, I'll just, and here's how, and we had a perceived stress scale. Um, how stressed in the last month? How often have you been upset because of something that happened unexpectedly? In the last month, how often have you been able to control irritations in your life? In the last month, how often have you felt difficulties were piling up so high you could not overcome them? So various ways to ask about self-perceived stress in these uh, lives of these sixth graders. We also asked them about negative things in their life. So I'll, I'll say one word of that. Uh, for a number of reasons, we think the amygdala, a structure is important for emotion, it might be an important player in stress. While they're in the scanner, doing functional MRI, we show them uh, fearful facial expressions or happy expressions or neutral expressions okay, uh, to provoke their brains. They're simply asking, they're simply pushing a button to say which face matches, but we're interested in how their brain is responding to these different kinds of emotional expression. Here's the first thing we found, three findings. First, across all of the students, the more stress they reported in their daily lives, the more powerful was their amygdala response to the negative facial expressions. And so we understand that makes sense. I mean, if you feel it's sort of a compounding negative spiral, right? If you see something negative and you're already in a stress space, that makes you even more stressed and even more negative than the amygdala is showing us. The more stress these children felt on a daily basis, the more their amygdala responded to these negative stimuli. After the training, the scores uh, uh, significantly, not dramatically, but significantly go down both for self-perceived stress and for uh, the uh, negative affect. Um, uh, so this is the coding group is not changing. Uh, the uh, mindfulness group is, and the black bars has to change. The coding group is not, they're staying steady. Some of our reviewers said, is computer coding stressful or something like that? It's, it's, it's not, and we asked students about it. Um, so, so only the children who were in the randomly assigned to the mindfulness group had reduced stress by self-report. Now, here's where brain measures are, are both scientifically interesting if you're a brain scientist, but necessary. So what if you said this? These are kids who are trying to be good students. We, they just had eight weeks of mindfulness. They come in and they now fill out a form that says, oh, I'm less stressed. Do I get an A? Right, because this is the obvious point of the course is kind of to, does that make sense? Okay. You know, are they just telling us what we want to hear? But if we see a very specific brain difference, that makes us more confident uh, that something really happened in these individuals than they're simply giving us the answers that we want. And I wouldn't tell you if this didn't work. Uh, only the children uh, who, when they came back, showed, who had the mindfulness uh, intervention uh, showed a reduction in response to the fearful faces. Only the children in the mindfulness group and within that group the more they improved, the more was the reduction in their brain response. It correlated within that group, so in a dose response way. So that makes us more kind of confident that, that this self-reported reduction in stress is a genuine report. We don't think they could manipulate their brain responses in these ways. Um, so I talked about these things, and I have you know, fabulous collaborators, some of them here and others as well, and thank you very much. I know we ask questions in the moment, but do you have any follow-up questions? Yeah. Um, as a parent in a bilingual household, I'm curious if, in regards to any of your earlier projects having to do with language and sound, if that has ever been taken into account. Um, you may have spoken language and things like that. Spoken language or if it affected how they were hearing or the sounds and the phonemes. Uh, so we, we've looked a little bit of that at the edges because we do have a ver children are come from a, an amazing range of uh, bilingual and trilingual environments and, and, and that's just part of research, which is complicating for research, but it's nice for their um, But the overwhelming literature is, is, is um, that it's nothing but a positive uh, by, by almost, 
There's two kinds of findings, either no difference or positive, okay? So in, uh, in terms of exposure for, for reading levels, for language levels, for all these kinds of things. And um, you know, some people have talked about a bilingual advantage or uh, growing up for executive functions. It's a little bit back and forth, but it's always positive or none. And then recently there's also been, you may know this, um, some evidence of, of enhancement of uh, theory of mind, of understanding where other people are coming from, so to speak. And the interpretation of that is that um, uh, uh, often in households, it doesn't have to be this way, you know, different people speak different languages. One grandparent might speak this, and one parent might speak that, something like this. And that these children develop a practice that, oh, diff people are different from each other. And I have to understand them a little bit differently, one from the other, in this most practical way. But it, it, it transfers to broader uh, flexibility and social cognition. So uh, everything that we've ever seen is that, uh, you know, I think the literature is overwhelming that bilingual or, or more exposure is, is only a blessing to have additional language abilities. And um, you know, occasionally children get some, report some confusions a tiny bit in development, but they're tiny blips. And in a slightly longer run, it's all, it's all plus, as far as anybody can measure. Yeah. Is there work done on miniaturizing at the Ah, no. The closest thing you could do to think about that, EEG measures could go into schools. Um, um, uh, NEARS function, have you heard of F NEARS? It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way you can measure uh, 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 the fMRI signal on the surface cortex. Those are little devices that could go into schools. Um, and so we have some interest in working on those kinds of things that are possible to put into school environments or, or, or pediatrician environments. Yeah. I was wondering on your point regarding the uh, intervention on cognitive uh, respondents on the right hemisphere yeah. to the left. And you mentioned that was unexpected, but shouldn't it be expected? Because I think isn't that the electrolyzation of the left hemisphere is simpler, you have a critical period after that. It's, you don't get that representation of the left hemisphere or not. You know, that's a, that's a plausible interpretation is that we have passed for these children a period in which um, you know, the, the plasticity could be as available in the left, right? I, I don't know that we think that the right is more, less plastic or more plastic than the left, but it's possible. I mean, all these, uh, to me, the, all these things have these sequential properties. You know, as you have an experience, your brain tissue is somewhere is doing this and somewhere is doing that, and now you're trying to intervene with, with, you know, educationally. And you know maybe you can't go back to a, a, an initial starting point. This guy, which I, you know, it's, so it's not so much I, I guess as the plastic. It's that different tissue is already committed to other things, and it's hard to go back and uncommit that tissue. Does that make? Is that? Uh, 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 but that's kind of close to what you're saying. Just not a raw plasticity difference, but a, a available tissue difference uh, as the brain develops different skills. Was there a hand that way? Yeah. I was just wondering, um, how should we think about the distribution of SES? Because you mentioned earlier you recruit high SES participants. And so I'm thinking, is that generalizable? And if it's not, what can you do to recruit lower SES? Oh, so, so we, working with Marty and, and others, so we, and, 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 and Meredith Rowe here, yeah, we work hard to, to recruit a much more diverse sample. So when I said high SES, I, I think if you don't make that effort, you probably end up with a high SES sample because, you know, for many years, all the brain imaging for many years, especially when it's a PET scanning and had radioactive injections, it was all medical students, <laughs> you know, basically uh, medical centers practically, I mean, almost, you know. Uh, uh, and so um, with fMRI, it became a little bit broader, but again, the spontaneous participation in that kind of research where you have to know about the research, go to an academic center, think that research is a good thing, you know, uh, for your family to participate in. That's you know easier to do in a more supported uh, environment, and so if you don't make that effort, um, uh, but we do uh, by reaching out to schools, community organizations. Uh, M Marty's helped us a lot, and others in, in, in doing that. But but it has to be if you just run your experiments. So what you're saying, we're convinced that 95% of the in intuitively, and there's no evidence about this, that 95% you know, of our image knowledge about the human brain from brain imaging up until a few years ago was based on the upper quarter of. Yes, who shows up for imaging, who's a friend with the researcher doing that work and so on. That spontaneously, you're not going to get a representative sample. You have to make a large effort to do that. But it's an important effort to do, and we're trying to do that. Yeah. John, that's a related question that we discussed in the other project in there. So for those ones after the intervention that you see that actually the brain imaging shows the decrease in the, uh, like the amygdala activity in there, how 
a long and that uh, change in the brain activity sustains some time. Yeah. So this is a great question because of course we don't want just an eight week over and out. So we, we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, um, uh, I think it's a, almost a sure bet that to have that sustained, you would need mindfulness to be sustained uh, over a long time. That it's, it's like having a healthy diet or uh, exercising. You know, all the gyms, right, make all their profit in January when we sign up for <laughs> a year. Well, this is the year I'm going to exercise every day, right? Uh, uh, so so uh, we suspect that you would strongly suspect that you would need continuous mindfulness efforts to have the mindfulness benefits. But, I mean, there's a lot of things going on at once in there, right? On the one hand, um, mindfulness can be done pretty fast, actually. It's a pretty, a lot of people who are mindfulness enthusiasts say, like, three minutes a day is, is plenty. So, um, uh, and the other, you know, you're competing against the other sources of stress in that child's life, right? I mean, those don't go down. Those don't disappear. Um, and whatever the other sources uh, at home, in the community, in the school, and so on. So, yeah, so we, we don't know this scientifically, um, and I haven't seen much evidence about it, but we strongly suspect that it would need to be a continuing effort to have that continuing benefit. Okay, so um, thank you, thank John, you. For, for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for, for uh, coming out today. Um, so John will be around for a few minutes now if people have follow-up questions. If there's a... It's actually right out front to give us a little more room. Okay, <laughs> so there's snacks and like a little reception <coughs> out front if people feel the need for more cheese. And, um, <laughs> and then... Uh, and, um,